So good evening, everybody. My name is Rachel Christone. I'm the Director of Education here at the Salem Witch Museum. And I'm Jill Christensen, the Assistant Director of Education. So welcome to our Women's History Month virtual talk, Crazed in Her Understanding, Women's Woes During the Salem Witch Trials. So we do have just a couple of housekeeping announcements before we get started. Uh, so as always, we are going to turn our camera off so you can see the full PowerPoint screen as the presentation goes. Uh, we will turn it back on when we have time for questions. We are, uh, of course, recording this talk and it will be posted to our website and our YouTube page uh, next week, early in the week. So um, if someone you know missed it or you want to watch it again, it will be made available there. Our hope is that this presentation will take about 45 minutes. We may go over a little bit, but we'll try to keep it to 45 minutes. And we will have some time at the end for questions. So with that, let's get started. So today we will be discussing the cases of several women we have come across in our research who appear to have struggled with mental health issues. Some of these women were described as melancholy or crazed in their understanding. Others gave testimony during the witchcraft trials, which, which suggests an underlying issue. In this presentation, we will lay out what we know about these women, including the evidence of their struggles, and discuss how this influenced their involvement in the witchcraft trials. When appropriate, we may include reference to modern diagnoses, such as post-traumatic stress disorder or postpartum depression. However, please keep in mind, we are not mental health experts. These are just theories. Additionally, we will do our best to use the correct terminology as we navigate through this subject. We will be making an effort to use person-first language, describing what a person has rather than what a person is. In the words of the National Institute of Health, this is a way to emphasize the person and view the disorder, disease, condition, or disability as only one part of the whole person. Researching women in the colonial period can be a daunting task. Finding basic information about a woman's life, including her date of birth, her parents' identities, or maiden name is often difficult, if not impossible. Studies like Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's seminal work, Good Wives, underscore the complexity of this subject. As Ulrich notes, there are no female diaries in New England before 1750 and few female letters. For her study, Ulrich scoured through sermons, account books, probate inventories, church and court records, gravestones, and private papers to attempt to construct an image of the everyday life of a colonial woman. While this amazing scholarship can help paint a more detailed picture of the average woman, we are left to consider what it was like for women who struggled with mental health challenges in addition to the difficulties of daily life. Larry D. Eldridge offers a helpful synopsis of the difficulty of researching mental illness in the colonial period. He says, evidence regarding the mentally ill, oh, one slide behind. There we go. He says, evidence regarding the mentally ill in the early colonies is scattered and elusive. It comes not from meticulous records and scientific observations, but from the odd comment in a colonist's personal papers, the occasional battle over the control of an estate the rare prosecution of a mentally disturbed person for some infraction, or the infrequent official effort to provide for an isolated quote-unquote idiot. The verbiage used to describe a person suffering from mental illness varied widely. These individuals could be described as crazed, distracted, distempered, or deluded. Sometimes they would be called out of their wits, or in more colorful language, one part off the moon. This nondescriptive language presents a significant barrier for those studying individuals who struggled with mental illnesses in the colonial period. The brief and passing references which describe these conditions make it difficult to discern the true scope of a person's struggle. During this period, the poor and those who struggled with mental illness were maintained by their communities. According to Massachusetts Bay Colony law, each town was responsible for its unruly distracted persons. Care involved ensuring these individuals were fed, clothed, housed, prevented from harming themselves or others, and if possible, employed at some useful task. It was not yet common practice to send these individuals to poorhouses or workhouses. 
Instead, they would be taken in by local families who would be compensated by the town for their expenses. Frequently, family members would care for their distracted relatives, though this was not always a permanent solution. Individuals who appear to have needed considerable care were often passed from house to house year after year, as the burden of their care was evidently too much for one household. Normally, the behavior of a person who struggled with mental illness went unrecorded if no community support was needed. There were people on both sides of the 1692 witch trials who are described in the records with language suggesting mental illness or underlying psychological issues. We will highlight a few of these cases today. Those familiar with the story of the Salem witch trials almost certainly know the name Betty Paris, the nine-year-old daughter of Reverend Samuel Paris of, Samuel, of Salem Village. In January of 1692, Betty and her cousin Abigail began to exhibit signs of a strange and alarming illness. They fell to the ground, clutched their heads, hid under chairs, and made animal noises. This behavior would eventually be attributed to the work of a witch, ultimately sparking the Salem panic. We often look at the illness of these initial girls with wonder. What was wrong with these children? Is there a medical explanation for their behavior? Elizabeth Betty Paris was born in November of 1682, the middle of three children. At this time, the family was living in Boston where Samuel was employed as a merchant, though he would soon set his sights on the ministry. The family moved to Salem Village by 1688 when Samuel Paris began the lengthy process of becoming the minister. Granted the right to form their own church in 1672, the village had proved to be an irreparably divided community. Reverend Paris was the fourth candidate in only 16 years. By this time, the family also included his niece, Abigail Williams, and three enslaved individuals, Tichuba, John Indian, and a boy described only as a Negro lad who died in 1689. Little is known about Abigail. Details of her parentage or life after the trials remain unknown. Debate over the minister's terms went on with many balking at his demands. One of the most contentious items was his request for firewood to be given yearly freely. Though he was officially ordained in 1689, the struggle to collect his salary, including the needed firewood, would continue. The family soon found themselves running low on fuel in the cold New England winter. Tensions were running high in the Paris household. While it's difficult to say what plagued Betty Paris and Abigail Williams, two theories can be dismissed. This was not caused by guilt over forbidden fortune telling, as has long been the tradition. We can also discount the modern theory that ingested moldy bread, known as the ergot theory, caused them to hallucinate. Both of these theories are discussed at length on our website, SalemWitchMuseum.com, if you'd like to learn more. Some historians have speculated this behavior was caused by conversion disorder. According to historian Emerson Baker, conversion disorder was first identified by Freud, who suggested that a person's anxieties could be converted into physical afflictions. These symptoms could include not only tics, fits, and strange behaviors, but also numbness, blindness, paralysis, and an inability to speak. He goes on to say, conversion disorder causes physical symptoms that are completely real. They are not in any way faked or controllable. There were stresses inside and outside the Paris household in the years leading up to 1692. A similar witchcraft panic took place in Boston in 1688. An older Irish Catholic woman known as Goody Glover was executed for witchcraft, the first hanged for this crime in Massachusetts in 25 years. She stood accused of bewitching the Goodwin children who jerked, shook, were struck blind and mute. A pamphlet describing the afflictions was published by Boston minister Cotton Mather and widely circulated. The Paris family would have been aware of this frightening case and perhaps even owned a copy of this work. As we already mentioned, the Paris family was short on firewood and Reverend Paris still stood at odds with his congregation. He demanded respect and loyalty, sharpening rather than bridging the existing divides. One can only imagine what it must have been like for a child living in his home. 
Betty's behavior is particularly interesting if we follow her progress over the first few months of the witchcraft trials. Although she and Abigail were present for the initial proceedings, they both disappear from the records relatively early on in the panic. Betty was sent out of the home to live with extended family in Salem Town in late March. St Stephen Sewell, the husband of uh, Samuel Paris's cousin, hosted Betty for the duration of the trials. Her torments and seizures were initially significant enough that her new hosts feared for her life. However, her afflictions gradually eased during her time away from her family, and she eventually made a full recovery. Abigail, who remained in the Paris household, also disappears from the proceedings by the end of June. Baker notes, their exit marks the end of one stage of the witch hunt and the beginning of a second phase, during which deceptive, if not fraudulent, behavior was a much more real possibility. Betty appears to have lived a normal life in the years after the witchcraft trials. While living in Sudbury in 1710, at the age of 27, she married Benjamin Barron. The couple settled in Concord. Benjamin was employed in numerous vocations at times described as a yeoman, trader, cord wainer, and shoemaker. The couple had five children. The family eventually settled into a two-story house along the Lexington Road. An interesting aside can be found in Marilyn Roach's fascinating article, That Child Betty Paris, Elizabeth Paris Barron and the People in Her Life. In this piece, Roach records the transfer of land from Betty and her husband to Samuel Dudley in 1726. Several years prior, three daughters of the neighboring Blanchard family experienced fits and visions, crying out that they were being tormented by the specter of Dudley's wife, Abigail. When Abigail died in childbirth, the affliction of the Blanchard girls ceased and they recovered. Two years after the land deal with Goodman Dudley, the eldest Blanchard daughter admitted that their accusation of Goodly, Good, Goody Dudley had been fraud, started as foolishness and continued from fear of discovery. Was Elizabeth aware of this story, one with such haunting similarities to the panic of her childhood? How did she react to this story as a grown woman? We can only speculate. Another fascinating figure in the Salem Witch Trial story is 18-year-old Susanna Sheldon of Salem Village. One of the afflicted accusers, Sheldon reported actions and elaborately detailed stories are confounded. confounding. While at times one feels she is totally play-acting and with an accomplice no less, no less. When delving into her past, she is clearly a troubled soul. Did everything she'd experienced cause her to suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder? Was she a disordered personality who needed a lot of attention? Well, you can only guess, but her experiences as a child appear to have had a tremendous impact on her later behavior. Susanna was affected by two 17th century wars. The first was King Philip's War, which largely took place from 1675 to 76 in the southern part of New England, although it continued until 1678 to the north. King Philip was the English name for Massasoit's son Metacom, or Metacomet, Sachem of the Wampanoag. Mary Beth Norton's great book about the Native War's impact on the Salem Witch Trials, In the Devil's Snare, describes Susanna's background. In October of 1675, the Black Point Garrison in Scarborough, Maine, which we can see circled on the map, was attacked and the requested military help didn't come. In the garrison was William Sheldon, his wife Rebecca, and their daughter Susanna, less than two years old at the time. Rebecca's sister was married to Arthur Alger, and you can see the Alger family locations also circled on the map. He was a man who died in the garrison as a result of a nearby native attack two days earlier. Says Norton, the young Susanna must have witnessed both her uncle Arthur's death agonies and her aunt's and mother's consequent grief. William moved his family south to Massachusetts to escape the bloodshed. And before we move on, the third circle on the map shows Susanna, Susanna's brother Godfrey's homestead. Black Point was surrendered to the Wabanaki, the native people of that area, and wasn't repopulated with white colonists again until the early 1680s. Among them was the Sheldon family, who returned to Maine. Reverend George Burroughs, formerly of Salem Village, 
was recruited to join the community as their minister. Norton suggests the young Susanna likely heard negative comments about Burroughs, who would later play a major role in the Salem trials. King William's War, named for England's King William III, broke out a decade later, lasting from 1688 to 1697. This found New France pitted against New England, and each had their respective native allies. Many of the battles took place in Maine, with frontier towns burned and colonists massacred. Numerous Essex County residents lost family and property. William Sheldon moved once again to escape this war, bringing the family to Salem Village in 1688. Misfortune continued to plague the family. Marilyn Roach said Susanna's 10-year-old brother Nathaniel died suddenly and distracted when they arrived in Salem Village. According to Norton, the oldest Sheldon's son, Godfrey, a militia member, died in 1690 at the age of 24, killed in the wars. Susanna's father, William, fell and cut his knee in December 1691 and died, likely of gangrene or tetanus. By 1692, the Sheldon family had been reduced to a widowed mother, one son, Ephraim, and five daughters. Many Salem residents were refugees from the wars to the north, and several became entrenched in the witch accusations to come on one side or another. Susanna Sheldon was 18 in 1692. Her only living brother, Ephraim, is actually the first to appear in the records from the time in early April, when he witnessed Putnam's servant, Mercy Lewis, have a seizure at Ingersoll's Tavern and named Sarah Cloyce as her tormentor. Mercy was another refugee from Maine. In late April, Susanna's elaborate and frightening stories began and continued for two months. Susanna was visited by a veritable procession of specters and ghosts in that time. She accused more than a dozen people, although as Norton points out, Susanna Sheldon's many lurid visions seem not to have been recast as depositions, which could indicate skepticism about the validity of her testimony. Susanna's first target was wealthy Salem merchant Philip English. She claimed he or his specter, his ghostly image, stepped out of his pew at one Sunday church meeting, accompanied by the devil himself, and pinched her. She later saw the pair again on the road home, and Philip told her the devil was now her god, and he wouldn't pinch her again if she touched the devil's book. A day later, English's specter came once more, pinched her, and said he would kill her if she would not touch the book. It seems touch the book means signing away one's soul to the devil. Interestingly, these visions came to Susanna just two days after Philip's wife, Mary, had been arrested on witchcraft charges. A warrant was issued for Philip himself by the end of the month. He fled Salem to escape, but was eventually apprehended at May's end after a second warrant was issued. He would remain a target of Susanna and feature in future visions. Perhaps it was because, as an Isle of Jersey-born man, his first language was French. The natives fighting the English in Maine were allied with the French to the north. Could she have been frightened or suspicious of French-speaking people? Susanna claimed to be visited by many more specters and ghosts in April, including the devil, who arrived with Sarah Buckley and her daughter, Mary. Susanna said one of these apparitions nursed two little things like young cats with no hair and ears like a man. Another day, she recalled that Goody Buckley carried her away for a mile through the air, one imagines, insisting she signed the book or she would be killed. Susanna testified that subsequently, William Shaw Jr. plowing in his father's field, heard her screaming and breaking sticks in the woods and fighting in a violent manner where Sarah Buckley had dropped her. Also in April, Susanna continued to be visited by the specters of people in jail and their familiars or animal companions. Among them, Mary English and a yellow bird, Giles Corey and a pair of turtles, and Bridget Bishop with a snake. Always, said Susanna, she was able to fend them off and refuse the devil's entreaties. In May, someone Susanna had known in Maine came to her in spectral form, the now accused Reverend George Burroughs, formerly a minister in Salem Village. Burroughs' specter threatened to starve or choke her and said he would kill her if she testified against him. 
Nevertheless, on May 9th, she testified that the ghosts of Burroughs' first two wives told her the Reverend had murdered them. When he was ordered to look at Susanna during his examination, she dropped to the ground as if struck. Around the same time, Susanna also had a vision of four dead people who reported that the recently accused John Willard of Salem Village had murdered them. She then witnessed Willard Spectre, who told her he had been a witch for 20 years, suckling two black pigs at his breasts. Susanna's descriptions were particularly gruesome. One of the ghosts pulled aside his winding sheet to show a pitchfork embedded in his side, she said. Soon, more specters tormented Susanna, particularly those of accused persons who fled to avoid arrest. On May 21st, she was struck deaf, mute, and blind by specters of Sarah Proctor, Daniel Andrews, and George Jacobs Jr. The next day, the specter of Philip English appeared and put a knife to her throat. Philip, in the flesh, was at this time in hiding himself. In a disturbing and puzzling incident a month later, visitors to William Shaw's house found Susanna convulsing with her hands tied so tightly that they had to be cut free. She blamed the specter of Lydia Dustin, an elderly woman from Reading, for her predicament. Reportedly, she was found with her hands bound, hanging from a hook. On five occasions, she was discovered with her hands tied tightly, blaming the specters of Dustin twice and Sarah Good twice. And in court with Martha Carrier, she once again had her hands unaccountably tied together, which she informed troubled onlookers was done by Carrier specter. Her behavior and vivid vision seemed to indicate Susanna was a troubled person. She was also clearly dialed in to the news of the day. After naming English, she focused on those who were already named, arrested, or being examined. It's interesting to note that she was afraid of those who had fled to escape imprisonment. English himself, John Willard, Daniel Andrews, George Jacobs Jr., and Elizabeth Colson, for example. One can almost imagine her fear about accused witches who were not safely in jail. Were they going to turn up at her house? Could they find her? And what is going on with the multiple occasions when her hands were tied so tightly and she was hanging on a hook? Someone had to help her create these scenarios. We'll never know for sure who her accomplice was or what drove Susanna to relate such vivid and frightening stories. Was she suffering from a mental episode or was she making it all up? Susanna Sheldon is one of the few accusers who appears in records in later years. Historian Emerson Baker reveals she moved to Rhode Island to live with a cousin, and in 1694, the Rhode Island court referred to her as a person of evil fame. Baker also speculates that she may have been the unnamed person who Beverly's Reverend John Hale was referring to when he describes a fortune-telling method used by young ladies to predict their future husbands. This was a Venus glass, which involved breaking an egg into a glass of water. The egg whites suspended in the water would take on various shapes, ostensibly revealing the occupation of one's future mate or predicting future events. One young woman had confessed to using this folk magic and claimed she had seen a coffin. And by the way, this is the only reported incident of fortune telling used by the afflicted girls. Baker suggests that Reverend Hale's comment, she was followed by diabolical molestations to her death and so died a single person, is a good description of Susanna Sheldon. Baker also believes she may have died by 1697 at the age of 23. When we initially discussed writing this presentation, one of the first women who came to mind was Ann Putnam Sr. As some of you may know, over the past several years, we have been creating descendant resource packets. We initially started with the 20 executed victims and have gradually been expanding them to include individuals who were accused but not executed, ministers and accusers. Rachel took on the project of a combined packet for Thomas Putnam, his wife Ann Sr. and daughter Ann Jr. This family was at the center of the witchcraft panic. Thomas acted as a secretary for the court, recording over a hundred depositions, in addition to filing dozens of complaints of witchcraft as a private citizen. Ann Sr. made numerous accusations against a few individuals, and 12-year-old Ann Putnam Jr. 
was one of the most active accusers, likely influenced by her parents' fears. Researching and writing these packets has become a favorite project of ours as it allows us to focus on one individual at a time. It's fascinating to examine the involvement of just one person and the many motivations and experiences that influence them. In the case of Anne Senior, Rachel found herself having unexpected empathy as she read more about her story. This is yet another case of a woman who appears to have struggled with significant emotional issues. Anne Putnam Sr. was born to the prosperous Carr family on March 16, 1652 in Salisbury, Massachusetts. She was the youngest child and the family's fourth daughter, born the year before her eldest sister was married. She met her future husband, Thomas Putnam Jr., while living with her sister and brother-in-law in Salem Village. Thomas was a third-generation member of the local prosperous Putnam family. Anne was 17 at the time of their marriage. Though not unheard of, this was a slightly younger marital age for a woman of the 17th century, as most waited to wed until their 20s. Thomas and Anne experienced disappointment after disappointment in the early days of their marriage. Both had expected sizable inheritances from their fathers, and both had been sorely disappointed. When the afflictions began in 1692, Anne was 31 years old and had given birth seven times. She was the mistress of a house comprised of her husband, six children under the age of 12, and a 17-year-old servant. Over the preceding eight years, she had experienced an incredible amount of loss, including the deaths of two of her sisters, her brother, several nieces and nephews, and her mother. In late 1689, her two-month-old daughter, daughter died. In 1691, she had given birth to a son, and by the spring of 19, 1692, she was pregnant yet again. When the afflictions began in January of 1692, the Putnams were one of the first families impacted outside the home of Reverend Samuel Paris. In late February, 12-year-old Anne Jr. began experiencing the symptoms of bewitchment. The illness would not stop there. After a month of tending Anne, the family's servant, Mercy Lewis, also fell ill. Historian Mary Beth Norton comments on the worsening situation in the Putnam household, noting, girls having fits, adult men scrutinizing their every move, a myriad of bystanders at all hours of the day and night, and little or no assistance available. No wonder then that Ann Carr Putnam reported that by Friday, March 18th, she was wearied out in helping to tend my poor afflicted child and maid. Four days after Mercy's fits began, Ann Senior lay down to rest in the middle of the afternoon and found herself almost pressed and choked to death. She too was now afflicted. On March 23rd, Diodat Lawson, a former minister of Salem Village, visited the Putnam house and found Ann Senior recovering from one of her episodes. He describes this experience in his April work, A Brief and True Narrative. During this visit, Thomas and Ann asked the Reverend to pray with them. Once the prayers were concluded, Ann's body went rigid. When her husband came to her aid, her body began to violently flail and jerk. She appeared to confront an invisible specter, which she identified as her neighbor, Rebecca Nurse. Lawson recalls, quote, she was sorely afflicted, her mouth drawn on one side, and her body strained for about a minute. She called to the specter, be gone, be gone, be gone. Are you not ashamed, a woman of your profession, to afflict a poor creature so? What hurt did I ever do you in my life? And then she proceeded to argue with the apparition about a scriptural passage. The reference to the specter's profession may indicate Rebecca assisted with births, as was common among female neighbors. One wonders at the particular animosity and senior shows towards the elderly Rebecca Nurse. On March 24th, Rebecca was brought before the magistrates for questioning. Anne Senior was overcome with violent convulsions before the proceedings began while the other witnesses, including both Ann Jr. and Mercy Lewis, were afflicted during this examination. Ann Sr.'s distress was so great, her husband had to carry her from the meeting house. The details of a past dispute or personal quarrel between these women have eluded the historical record. As Marilyn Roach notes, what chance remark, 
quirk of personality or misunderstanding had caused the original misgiving is lost. Perhaps Rebecca had once commented on the deaths of Anne's children as being God's will, an unfathomable sorrow that had to be endured. After Rebecca's examination, Anne Sr. does not appear in the records for two months, though Anne Jr. and Mercy Lewis continued to experience spectral torment. It may have been around this time when Ann Sr. discovered she was pregnant with her eighth child. From this point on, Ann would remain at home, away from the proceedings, only appearing before the magistrates on two more occasions. In early June, she claimed to be afflicted by the specter of John Willard, the Salem Village resident accused by Ann Jr. John Willard had previously acted as a deputy constable, helping to locate and arrest individuals who were accused. However, after interacting with both the accusers and accused, Willard had a change of heart and refused to continue assisting in arrests. He soon fled to property he owned outside of Salem. Shortly thereafter, Ann Jr. reported his specter among her tormentors. During Willard's examination, Ann Jr. testified that his specter had appeared to her and, quote, told me he had whipped my little sister Sarah to death and he would whip me to death if I would not write in his book. I saw the apparition of my little sister, Sarah, who died when she was about six weeks old, crying out for vengeance against John Willard. Anne Senior offered similar testimony against Goodman Willard, claiming she saw two ghosts in winding sheets who told her Willard murdered them. Not only that, but his specter came to her and bragged Quote, he had killed seven children in the village, including this deponent's child, Sarah, six weeks old. This would be the last testimony given by Anne Senior during the witchcraft trials. Anne Senior was a woman plagued by sadness. Her testimony gives the impression her affliction was entwined with the sorrows over her losses. While it's beyond our capacity to offer a diagnosis of this 17th century woman, one wonders if she experienced depression. Having so many back-to-back -back pregnancies, the recent loss of a child, and beginning yet another pregnancy in 1692 would understandably take its toll. Perhaps she, perhaps she suffered from what we would now know as postpartum depression. We can also consider there may have been an undiagnosed illness present in the Carr family. On two occasions, her brothers had suffered from serious emotional episodes one with fatal consequences. In the early 1670s, John Carr had hoped to marry a member of another prosperous Salisbury family, the Bradburys. When George Carr, patriarch of the family, refused to approve the union, John laid so much to heart he grew melancholy and by degrees much crazed. He would never recover from this heartbreak, falling into a deep depression and dying in 1689. Another brother, James Carr, had also suffered a mysterious illness after a failed courtship with yet another member of the Bradbury family. Though James recovered, he believed the sickness may have been the result of bewitchment. It's difficult to say if there is a connection between these maladies. Did depression run in this family or were these instead disconnected conditions? We'll never know with certainty. The memory of these episodes would resurface during the Salem witch trials. Anne Jr., along with several of her maternal uncles, gave extensive evidence against Mistress Mary Bradbury. During Mary's examination, Anne Jr. claimed to see the ghost of her uncle. She told the court, quote, there appeared to me my uncle John Carr in a winding sheet, whom I very well knew in his lifetime. And he told me that Mistress Bradbury had murdered him and that his blood did cry for vengeance against her. Though Mary Bradbury was found guilty and sentenced to execution, she was able to escape from jail and eventually return home to Salisbury. The memory of past illness resurfaced again and again in 1692, providing the bereaved families with the explanation that these maladies were the work of a malevolent witch. In his seminal work, Salem Witchcraft, 19th century historian Charles Upham poignantly describes Anne Putnam Sr., stating, quote, An accumulation of disappointments, vexations, and consuming griefs spread like a dark cloud over her life. The deaths of her own children and her sister, Mary, her sister Bailey and her children 
and her sister Baker's children, and finally, the long-continued and constantly recurring sufferings, tortures, convulsions, fits, and trances of her daughter Anne and her servant woman Mercy Lewis, under, as she fully believed, a diabolical hand. An air of sadness in the wild ravings of imagination pervades her testimony, unquote. Her involvement in the Salem witch trials is what brings a woman like Anne Putnam Sr. to our attention. How many other colonial women lived parallel lives, their suffering unrecorded? A mere seven years after the witchcraft trials, Thomas Putnam died at the age of 47. Anne died two weeks after her husband, on June 8, 1699, at the age of 37, leaving behind 10 children. Charles Upham remarks, it's not strange that, in addition to all her woes, the death of her husband was more than Anne Putnam could bear, and that she followed him soon to the grave. Another woman who had suffered with mental challenges, as described to the court by her own mother, was Rebecca Jacobs. She was the daughter-in-law of the elderly George Jacobs Sr., who was himself executed as a witch on August 19. Her story is a heartbreaker. Jacob Sr. was 81 in 1692 when he was accused of witchcraft by his servant, Sarah Churchill. She also said her employer, who moved about with the aid of two walking sticks, beat her. The servant went on to accuse George's son, George Jr., and his granddaughter, 17-year-old Margaret, who lived with her grandfather in Northfields or Salem Farms, rather than with her parents in Salem Village. The niece and servant of Dr. William Griggs, he was the man who first diagnosed witchcraft as the underlying reason for the early afflictions, was 17-year-old Elizabeth Hubbard. She was the first to name Rebecca Jacobs as a witch. A complaint was filed in mid-May, naming several people, including Rebecca and her husband, George Jacobs Jr., as well as her brother and nearby neighbor, Daniel Andrews. It was known by many people that Rebecca had been a troubled soul for more than a decade. When Constable John Putnam arrived to take the three into custody that Saturday, May 14, he discovered that both George and Daniel had fled. Only Rebecca and four or five of the youngest Jacob's children were at home, ranging in age from 15 to two and a half. There may have been an infant as well. According to Marilyn Roach's account, the constable arrested Rebecca, quote, although he had trouble persuading her to accompany them until he promised she could soon return. She may have taken the youngest child with her as it was apparently still nursing. The rest she had to leave behind. Her children ran after her crying a long way down the road to the village until the cavalcade outdistanced them and disappeared, unquote. That is truly one of the saddest images in all of the trials. Nearby neighbors took the children in to care for them. Rebecca remained in jail for 11 months. When examined, she, like so many others, confessed that yes, she had tormented her accusers and made a pact with the devil. She was plagued by guilt, convinced that she was responsible for the accidental death of her two-year-old daughter, Mary, who had drowned in a well seven years earlier. Rebecca talked about this tragedy frequently while in prison. Rebecca's case never went to trial. Governor William Phipps dissolved the court of Oyer and Terminer in October of 1692. Her mother, Rebecca Fox, who lived in Cambridge, filed two petitions in November. One was addressed to Phipps and the Boston Council, the other to Chief Justice William Stoughton and the court. In the first, Fox wrote, Whereas Rebecca Jacobs, daughter of your humble petitioner, has a long time, even many months now, lie in prison for witchcraft and is well known to be a person crazed, distracted, and broken in mind, and that she has been so these 12 years and upwards. Some have died already in prison and others have been dangerously sick, and how soon others, and among them my poor child, by the difficulties of this confinement, may be sick and die, God only knows. A new court heard the remaining cases in January of 1693. On January 4th, both Rebecca and her daughter Margaret were found not guilty. Margaret was released in February when a stranger offered to pay her jail fees, and Rebecca was released the following month when the family was finally able to pay her jail fees. 
George Jr. returned from hiding in June, rejoining his abandoned family. He took over the family farm, going against his executed father's last will and wishes. We have come across other similar stories while researching the Salem witch trials. For example, in a previous lecture, we spoke extensively about the struggle of Anne Dolliver, daughter of Salem Town's Reverend John Higginson. Anne, too, suffered significant misfortune in her adult life. Penniless and desperate after being abandoned by her husband, Anne was forced to return to Salem with her three children to live with her father and stepmother. Accused of witchcraft and arrested in 1692, Anne was later described as crazed in her understanding by her father. She made several alarming pronouncements during her witchcraft examination, including a story that she had once stayed out all night alone in the forest and had made wax poppets. Here again, we can only guess as to what plagued Anne Oliver. What did Reverend Higginson mean when he called her overbearingly melancholy and crazed in her understanding? Did she suffer from depression or was there another underlying condition? While preparing for a previous Women's History Day lecture, we began to wonder if Anne struggled to live in accordance with traditional social expectations for a woman. Perhaps she did not wish to be a wife or mother, did not want to remarry and begin the process of running a house once more. Maybe she just wanted to live on her own terms. This is pure speculation, one informed by a heavy dose of imagination, but it's interesting to wonder at the meaning of these brief comments. Likely due to her father's important position in the community, Anne was never brought to trial and was released back to her family. Before his death, Reverend Higginson arranged for the care of his daughter in the typical fashion of the day. She would be supported by a local family and her expenses paid by Salem Town for the remainder of her life. If you'd like to learn more about Anne Dolliver, head over to our website to watch our previous Women's History Day event in memory of Anne Dolliver. Two more stories before we conclude. We have the sad tale of Christian Trask, a Beverly woman who suffered a deadly mental episode after a confrontation with Edward and Sarah Bishop in 1690. The bishops ran an unlicensed tavern in their home, allowing people to engage in prohibited behavior like excessive drinking and gambling. Their story, we should note, has been mistakenly combined with that of Bridget Bishop of Salem Town. There was a tangling of the last names corrected only in recent years. After confronting the bishops about the tavern's unruly patrons, Goody Trask is described as becoming distracted and began having seizures and speaking ominously of suicide and murder. She evidently came to believe Sarah Bishop was bewitching her. After a month of rapid decline, Goody Trask killed herself by taking a pair of sewing scissors to her windpipe, severing her jugular. A strange connection from this story, Anne Dolliver was entrusted into the care of none other than Sarah and Edward Bishop after the trials were over. She would live with the Bishop family for the rest of her life in Rehoboth, Massachusetts. Another case is that of Elizabeth Johnson Jr. You may have recently heard of this troubled individual as her name was erroneously missed in past legislature clearing all of those convicted of witchcraft during the Salem witch trials. Elizabeth was one of several members of the family of Reverend Francis Dane of Andover who were accused in 1692. Both Elizabeth Jr. and her mother, also named Elizabeth, were accused and arrested during the Salem panic. Reverend Dane described his 22-year-old granddaughter as simplish at best. The meaning of this phrase is unclear. She may have suffered from a learning disability or a developmental delay. In January of 1693, the new court no longer accepted spectral evidence resulting in few convictions. When Elizabeth faced the magistrates that month, she confessed and was one of the last to be convicted during the Salem witch trials. Governor William Phipps issued last minute reprieves for all those convicted in late January, including Elizabeth Jr. When the Massachusetts General Court began to grant the restoration of civil liberties for those convicted during the Salem witch trials, a process that began in 1710 and lasted until 2001, one name was missed. According to Emerson Baker, Elizabeth Johnson Jr. apparently was left off the list because she was confused with her mother, also named Elizabeth Johnson, who was accused and tried but not found guilty. 
This error was corrected in the summer of 2022, thanks to the efforts of a middle school class in North Andover, Massachusetts. These are just a few of the stories from the 1692 witch hunt which highlight the mental health struggles of colonial women. In most cases, the only reason these stories are visible is because the individuals were drawn into the witchcraft panic. Learning about these women provides yet another lens for us to understand the motivations and experiences of some of those ensnared in the Salem witch trials. And as always, we have included a list of recommended reading, um, which we consulted as we prepared for this lecture. So that is the end of the presentation. And now we do have some time for questions. So we have a question, is Goody Trask related to Richard Trask? So uh, she is not, I believe. Um, Richard is a great help to all of us who study the Salem witch trials. There are many, many Trasks. They came here in the early days. And I don't believe she's in the direct line with Richard. And for those who don't know, he's the archivist of the um, uh, Danvers, Danvers, Danvers Historical um what is it, Denver's? The PBD Institute. Yeah. And he's the one who found the the uh, parsonage back yeah. in, in the 1970. Does anybody else have any questions? I'll give a minute. Oh, Christian is your third great grandmother. Oh. Yeah. It's a very sad story. It is a terrible story. We'll give one more minute. In case anybody's typing in the chat. Uh, is there any proof it's, of what happened? So I was going to say, I, I believe, now I'm going to talk off the top of my head, that there was some question about exactly what happened there with Christian, because I think they did a like a coroner's report or something. And could she really have killed herself in that way? But I don't know much more detail than that. I think it's not cut and dry, clear. Uh, so oh, we geez. see, do you have any record of where Ann Foster is buried? Um, if you go to the Salem Witch Museum uh, website and look at the online sites tour and look at Andover, there's an Ann Foster site there. Um, it is very unclear where she is. There's three ideas of possibility, probably near Foster Pond, in South Andover um, and probably under the water now because they increased that pond um, over the years. That's a best guess. There's a couple other ideas of where it might have been. See, there's a Putnam descendant here. Nice. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for our Friday night talk. Um, as always, we will post the recording next week. So if you came in a little bit late, um, when we see the last comment here, do you all listen to the Salem podcast? I think you shall team up. I actually did an episode for if I think it's called, I hope this is the, same, the same podcast. podcast yeah. for several, There's a yeah. lot that have very similar names. I did just do a lecture, uh, what a lecture, uh, um, an episode for a Salem witch trials podcast, but is it the same one who can say, <laughs> well, thank you. Sarah and Jeffrey. No, it was a different one. It was, um, what's his name? Greg something. Um, but yeah, there's, we're always open to do uh, talks with podcasts. Do you have any recommendations for podcasts? Not in relation to the Salem Witch Trials, to be honest. And I say that entirely just because I haven't listened to any in their entirety. I'm sure there are wonderful Salem Witch Trials podcasts. Uh, this one, Salem, the podcast, is apparently recommended by someone in our comments. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know off the top of my head, um, because honestly, I just can't handle more Salem witch trials. <laughs> we need it all day long. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And you can contact us. Um, you can send a message to our FAQ, which is just FAQ at SalemWitchMuseum.com. And if you address it to the education department, it will make its way to um, me and Jill. So, all right. Well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. We hope you have a great rest of Women's History Month. Um, and please, if you're interested in this topic, definitely check out some of these resources. Um, there's some great books in here if you're interested in learning more about the trials. All right, have a good evening, everybody.